Thanks for making Julian. <laughs> That's for Christine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for Christine, exactly. ABC 7:30 show this evening. I guess I'll be on it to talk about how the U.S. government really wants to kill Julian Assange. Australia needs to ensure that the government of Australia does not allow that to happen. Each person in Australia needs to call whatever representative they have and to pressure the prime minister to ensure Julian Assange's safety. Even if you think that he's not the greatest guy in the world, I don't know how you could think that. But even if you didn't think that. It is extremely important to support him because Australia may be able to actually keep him safe where many, many people would like to see great harm come to him. And I think it is really important to support Julian. And when Australians are supporting Julian, that is very, very useful for him and will hopefully keep him alive and safe and, if possible, out of prison as well. So if you haven't contacted people in the government, you should take five minutes out of your day, maybe every day, until he's back and safe in Australia, to ask for him to be returned safely. Because if the U.S. government gets a hold of Julian Assange, they will kill him. Like Bradley. Le probably like they would like to do to Bradley Manning, for example. So it is really important to support Julian, and I really hope that everyone takes the time to do that. But that said, the reason that I came to Australia today was to talk about how censorship on the internet is not a thing that is reasonable for a democratic country to support. So when you hear someone like Conroy talking about how we need to civilize the internet or how we should censor the internet, we need to remember that what he is saying and what the Gillard government is saying is that they wish for you to be ignorant of the things that objectively exist on the internet. And we need to reject that. We need to know that this is not actually going to improve our lives when things are censored, when we don't have the right to see things that objectively exist. It is absolutely the case that we should be free from state terrorism. Surveillance of our lives creates an emergent phenomenon of self-censorship. Having been detained at airports in different parts of the world by the U.S. government's request, I can tell you that it really fucks up a whole lot of your life to have that kind of thing rain down on you. And the key part of that is that it starts with identification. And right now, the world that we're living in allows for a surveillance state that the likes of which even the Stasi did not have when they employed something like 50% of the German population of the GDR. And this is, a, I think, a quite a serious problem, this, this idea, as Julian would call it, so-called lawful, lawful interception. The thing is that what they say is so-called lawful interception, but what they mean is spying on you. Just to be clear about that, they mean that they wish to be able to watch you without you having any idea that they are watching you. They wish to be able to record what it is that you're doing so that later they can go back retroactively when you have gained some attention or when you have done something so they can dig up dirt on you and they can do something to you that has happened in the past. Even if it was not illegal, they will simply use it against you. You see this time and time again throughout history, but what is possible now because of electronic surveillance is extremely dangerous and extremely scary because it is in a sense possible to capture almost everything that we do. I mean, imagine if, for example, these roads to be built, they had to have a microphone every five meters, and they had to have a camera, and the, only the police were allowed to access them, and you could not build that road otherwise. And that's what governments around the world are trying to do with the internet. They're trying to say that to install things, such as routers and switches, the police get to monitor them, and no one is allowed to know. And we have to reject that kind of surveillance state, because with it comes censorship. Right? When you see that people wish to censor, it's because they can surveil you and make a decision about what it is you're looking at. Right? Censorship is a second order effect. When someone has blocked a page, it is because they have inspected each page you have visited online. When you use a chat system and they record it, they see what you have said with your friends in private and in confidence. I mean, I could say use Tor or use encryption, but you know, the thing is that we actually need the law to protect us because the state is very, very powerful. And one of the things that we actually have to make sure that we do is that the law that constrains the state is one of the few things that when it is actually constraining it 
economically, it is actually not able to use its extreme power. And, and so it sounds like a kind of a crazy thing, but when we give a little in the surveillance game, we end up with a lot of the, of the actual censorship game. We, we really don't want that. Because the, the unintended consequences essentially are that when we try to block things, supposedly like child pornography and terrorism sites, we end up blocking dentists' websites, right? I mean, it seems to me probably that was not the reason that the filter was being pitched in the first place. And the mere fact that they screwed it up so early on doesn't bode well for them doing it well in the long run either. But it starts with believing that the police have a right to spy on you. And they don't. Fuck them. They have absolutely no right to do that. And Occupy is, is, is very powerful specifically because it's non-violent. In fact, pretty much all the violence in Occupy comes from the police, such as what has happened here. Right? And so I think it is extremely important to know that when people are supporting surveillance, they're actually buying into governing through coercion. And you can see that when they, ex when they exert their violence here. This is the same power structure that wishes to exert their surveillance and censorship powers. It's the same thing. It's all related. We have to reject the violence against peaceful protesters just the same way that we need to reject the censorship and the surveillance state. All of these aspects of the state do not serve people in a democracy. Instead, we should have a transparent and accountable government, not one that commits violence among these people that are right here, all of you. That's not a reasonable government. When, when the police beat you up and not one cop has their head smashed by the state, you have to ask a question about why it is that the state protects the police who commit crimes against you. So, I feel like, it, you know, I'm, I'm basically preaching to the choir here, but I think it's really important to remember that each of us has some autonomy and some agency. Right? If you have a computer and you want to help other people to be free, you can run you can run services on your computer to help anonymize people, to help them to be free online. You can run a tour relay, for example. You can also do other things. You can get a job, and at the place where you apply for a job, you can apply, say, at the DSP or the AFP. You can be a whistleblower. You can go underground and infiltrate and show the crimes that they commit and show the power structures that, that promote this. It sounds ridiculous to say, you know, join and infiltrate, but realistically, if you want to change some of these structures, you need some information about those structures. So you either need to convince the people in the structures to make the changes, or you need to become that. But you have to remember, Richard Feynman, a really fantastic physicist once said, right, he said, when you start to do a thing, you have to remember why you're doing it. Right, the reason Julian Assange started WikiLeaks is because he cares about humanity, having a clue about what's happening and trying to make the world more transparent, government more accountable, to increase personal privacy and personal autonomy. So it's definitely possible to keep that in mind, to keep the idea that you, you don't think that people should be beaten by the police. And it, I think it would be kind of hard to infiltrate the police in that I personally could never put on a police uniform. Right, it just, it doesn't suit me. I'm not a man for uniforms. But it, it, it is, I think, really important to know that if you do that, you will make a big impact. You'll make a big impact being here too. But if you are working both sides of the equation, you'll be able to fuck it up from the inside in ways that they can't even imagine. Because they're used to clashing in the street. So if you instead take it into their buildings, one way or the other, non-violently, and just tell the truth. If you just tell the truth about what's happening, the structure itself can fall apart. Because when people do not consent, to what is actually happening. When the people of Australia, just like the rest of the people of the world, do not consent to people beating up nonviolent protesters, those people will be held accountable. It happened in Oakland. They covered up their badges, they were videotaped, they were revealed, they've been punished. I mean, it's not like the Oakland police are going away anytime soon, but it's good because it makes the police think twice about being a bunch of fascists, about committing violence against nonviolent protesters. I mean, the most important thing is just to continue to resist the unreasonable things that are taking place in the world.